going back to what we were doing, getting the A license requires us to take on special assignments on the jobs board to show we're qualified, involving a side trip to the Kotobukiya region, that's just another part of Electopia, then we get to the actual license test, and that's summarily taken care of. So, we're off to Yumland! Shadowman? What are you doing here? Well, apparently after his contract with World 3 expired... Not that you would know that without network transmission, ironically, since Shadow Man was a secret boss that lacked any expositionary interaction in the first game, Dark Miyabi, Shadow Man's operator, was approached by the organization Gospel to do some covert operation work for them. Miyabi is a modern-day ninja, his trade being assassination performed for a paycheck, and his navi reflects that professionalism. Unfortunately, Dark Miyabi is an interesting character they kind of dropped the ball on. Of the recurring non-main character net navvies, Shadow Man is one of the most appearing, second only to base in fact due to his popularity, and yet his operator is barely even given a glance over. Hell, this holds true for the anime as well. Shadow Man shows up in the first series and access, but Dark Miyabi doesn't pop up for the first time until stream episode 36, and makes about a dozen appearances in the anime, if not less. It kind of makes sense since he's a secretive assassin, but in a series that was often criticized for giving the squishy humans more screen time and development than the counterparts to the interesting robot masters, this is a case of the complete reverse. Due to timing, Lan and Mega Man are the first responders on the scene, receiving a warning that needs to be taken to the officials of Lactopia being the next target, only for another Navi to intervene. Yes! Cutman! Cutman is one of the easiest to beat net navvies in the entire series, so weak they need to force environmental obstacles to make the fight against him any challenge, and so recognized to be pitiful that in the anime they cloned him and made a Sentai team out of him to give him SOME menace, only for a lot of them to be utter bumblers at their assigned tasks. I mean, the only reason you even ever get injured in battle with him is when he pins you due to the required dodging of his humming scissors. I entered the battle with 80 health, and I left with 80 health. We take the message to the officials, who all get in a panic. UHR reassures them, however, by revealing he's close to finishing a program which will allow them to battle gospel navvies on an even footing. Making me question who programmed their navvies in the first place if they're stronger than those made by researchers whose entire job is technological development. But he needs Land's help in finding a rare program known as the Change Batch. We raid the BBSs for any leads, resulting in a meandering hut for a woman in ACDC, only to learn she's out at Okuden, only to learn her source is over in the Kotobukiya Square, and the navvy there gives us a key to... Yes! Yumland! Meaning we need to then head all the way back over there to see if we can't get the change batch. Okay, something I will admit that is a problem mostly absent for the first game that every other Battle Network does, the travel time sinks for the fetch quests just get freaking ridiculous. It never gets Digimon World 3 bad where they had us literally go from the far end of the game to the exact opposite side of it, and then back again for no other reason than to talk to one freaking person for a story event that they easily could have cut us back to! Especially in Mega Man's case, where you can always log out if you need to, and there are other entrances to the network that can shorten the trip. But there's no reason for a lot of them outside of artificially lengthening the game. To be fair, in later games they'd realize this and add in warp pads that shortcut you to regions to make the transits easier, though then they added new environmental mazes you had to memorize. One step forward, two steps back. So, yeah, Yum Square has the program, and unfortunately, it's considered a national treasure. And we have to steal it. Hang on, I know a guy. Yeah, Zoroku? How good are you at cyber theft? Damn it, Lupin! Now we have to fight our way out of the square. We get the program back to Yuichiro, who copies and puts it in an email back to the Yumland government. With it, he finishes the new system, and installs it into... Mega Man. Way to help your son over the government employees who are assigned to assist, daddy -o. Stick it to the man!
Shadow Man has insurgents attack the main square, distracting the officials and Lan, so Dark can send him into the mother computer at the heart of Lectopia's network and commerce. The responders are all overwhelmed, initially including Mega Man, as they all have to fight not just their navvies, but the guardian viruses of the system. Only for Mega Man to now get some help in that department, due to the change batch enhancing the power of the hub batch. So now, Mega Man has the power... A form change. Yeah, pretty much every major Japanese hero character got in in that craze in the 2000s. I honestly credit the rampant widespread success of Kamen Rakuga on that, especially since wow does that lead to a merchandising boom. Though personally I felt it worked really well for the Battle Network series considering, well, data is reconfigurable. And past this, yes, this becomes another staple in all following entries that was a new gameplay element this game introduced. And behold, the best style change you can get, Agua Custom Sir! Damn it, every time. Hold on one second, gotta reload a save and do a few more battles to affect the RNG. There we are. Aqua Custom Style! Now, some people prefer Elect Custom because the charge shot becomes the Elect Ring, which paralyzes enemies and allows you to then hit them with battleships and pro advances, but eh, I always preferred the water gun. And yes, custom style is the only style change you really want, due to it increasing the number of chips you can select. Style change is what much of the main quest has been building up to with the change batch program you retrieved earlier, and Mega Man can access up to five styles. Aside from custom, gut style maxes at the buster's attack power, and is accessed by using the buster a lot to defeat viruses. Team style comes from using a lot of navi chips, and thus increases the number of them you can use in a folder as this is where they began to be limited. Finally, for now, Shield Style comes from using defensive-type battle chips and gives you an aura and the ability to guard without using a guard chip. And each of them are randomly assigned an elemental alignment, meaning in exchange for this power, Mega Man now has an elemental weakness you need to look out for. Aside from the two I listed, Heat Styles change the buster into the firearm, and Wood Styles gives the tornado buster, that is seriously the worst navi weapon ever because it so rarely actually hits its freaking target. With my annoyance, well, always at elect chips, it frustrates me even more the wood style always seems the most useless. Though that may in turn be why I have such an animosity with elect elements anything in these games to begin with. Granted, I first saw these in the anime, where things were a bit flipped. Team Style allowed the fusion of navvies so Mega Man could use their powers instead of increasing the number of mega chips you could put in a folder, which kind of makes sense since the anime didn't use navvy or quantify mega chips as mega chips. And Custom Style in turn magnified a single chip type program advanced, so you only needed at most two of a given chip to use it. And likewise, that's understandable since the anime didn't have a custom menu-like limitation. At least until access with the whole preloaded cross-fusion battle chips thing. That they then would work around later with the battle chip gate. How the hell do I remember this stuff? Styles have V2 and V3 upgrades you gain by using the style more in battle, but all they really do is upgrade the power of your buster weapon, which is really only good for gut style. It would have been nice had Custom Style V2 and V3 expanded your custom window chips, or Team Style increased your navi chip powers, or Shield Style upgraded through its barrier types. But no, if you want true unlimited power, that requires a certain quest we will discuss when the time is right, which unlocks the best style. Anyways, the other official net battlers all have their navvies deleted, leaving solely Lan and the freshly arrived Chaud, who is suddenly back to being his arrogant son-of-a-bitch self. And just when you might think he had actually gone through character development, since this is a very similar situation to that with Dave, and he could really use that backup. Each of the mother computer regions have word puzzle barriers to progression. Step on the right panel, spelling out words, and you can pass easily. I have no idea what these puzzles were in the original Japanese version. I have been able to find any information, or video for that matter, which showcases what these would have been there, but I highly doubt they'd be a string of Romanized characters. Simple hiragana, maybe, but not Roman characters. 
However, Shadow Man duped us using Shadow Clones, the real one going to the main hub while Proto Man was distracted with one of the clones, thinking they'd send the weaker member to secure everyone's safety, with the clone then distracting the bigger threat. Unfortunately, it's not a record that we kicked Chod's ass six ways to Sunday. Though the scene leading up to that fight is arguably one of the best the series ever did, with Yuichiro finishing his anti-Navi blaster, but Shadow Man taunting him that using that weapon in their current position risked them doing his job for him in destroying the Mother Brain. Bah! Go through with it! It would make Samus happy! Not the way I intended, but it works for me! No! Proto Man jumps in, revealing he deleted the clone, and grapples with Shadow Man in full-on Goku fashion to prevent Shadow Man from dodging the shot and sacrifice himself in the process, only for Shadow Man's subordinates to take it for him. The dialogue, direction of the scene staging, even the music are all excellent for showcasing this and selling Shadow Man as an uber-competent antagonist, pushing everyone here to their limits. Shadow Man has all the ninja tricks you'd expect. Clones, Kawarimi counterattacks if you attack at the wrong time or hit the clones, and he's highly evasive. But if you can avoid hitting the clones by zeroing in on the one with the HP, he's not that awful an enemy. With Shadow Man deleted, for now, as Dark has backups of him, the Mother Computer is safe, and Gospel's leader summarily fires him, alongside murdering yet another of his subordinates that was assigned to spy on Shaud and Lan, and had failed to provide them information on their increased capabilities beforehand, even though Mega Man only got style change after this plan was already put into action. Still, in an effort to combat the ever-growing threat of Gospel, a global conference of net battling officials is called to take place in Netopia the Battle Network Universe counterpart to America. Because obviously America is known for its castles, right? Yeah, that's something that's always confused me about this trip. A major part of it is tied to a historical castle, but America is not known for its castles. That is England and Europe, which are more known for them. Creamland is what many consider to be the England equivalent in the series as well. They're also tied to this chapter of the game, from the setting, it makes sense for this trip to be to Creamland, as the entire area more gives off a, for lack of a better phrase, British feel to it. I don't know, maybe a localization change or something? I didn't exactly find much on that. Granted, that comes later. First Land needs to actually get on the trip to this foreign land on his own. Mail seeing us off with a wireless jack and transceiver and a roll chip. But the problems begin, when going through security... Lan keeps setting off the body scanners. Ugh, I know, right? Every time I gotta opt out for the pat down, because the comfy pants I wear always have bits of metal in them. I make every inch of what I pack count, so they also have to search through all my things. It's, it's just terrible. Though, keep in mind, this game was made in 2001, before many of the headaches that would come from the TSA the last decade and a half were even implemented. But you see the same kind of... Sir, your item isn't allowed on this plane, isms, with Hub being swiped from his hands and taken by the staff to be shoved into storage. And then, to add insult to injury, all of his money is stolen before he even leaves the country. You know, I just remember all the times Lan ends up saving the world later, and then suddenly find it hilarious to wonder what might have happened had Lan become cynical past this. Alright, time to save the world from being deleted by a rampant AI. Wait, it's that guy who stole my money! You know what? Screw it! You can all die for all I care! Fortunately, Chaud's douchiness seems to have waned again, and he used his official authority to get them exempted from the Take a Child's Brother That's Stuck in a Computer Clause. Though when we arrive, we then run into the thief and kick his ass to get our money back. Ha! Take that, hoser! There. Now we're feeling much better. Lan can just not catch a break. Also, to mimic the reaction of every first-time player of this game... <clears throat> Fuck! Now I have to start Belgian Collection all over again! <laughs> yeah, if you're playing the game yourself, just a heads up, stash a spare guard ship in one of your folders. You'll need it as part of the story events which will then allow you to win back your chip library. Still, yet another thing going wrong on this trip leaves Lan in a foul mood, leading to an argument between the two when Hub tries to cheer him up, Lan leaving him on the hotel floor as he goes to get some air, and runs into Higsby, who's on a rare chip hunt. 
The reformed merchant gets land to calm down and want to apologize for the argument, only to find out someone broke in, and now his passport is gone as well. Okay, new rule. Back up to the backups. Fortunately, we run into an old man that directs us to Jim. Big Jim. Big Jim Slade. Big Jim's a Backstreet's local that can help us, except first we need to get in with his posse. And preemptively adding that to the list of words I should never say again. Which in turn can be done by giving Jim that old rare guard chip I mentioned before. I don't know, I guess Metors don't show up in Netopia. Must be a union thing. But if you don't have it, you need to battle this guy named Raoul to get the passcode for his jack import. Raoul is the operator of Thunderman, and as I have Aqua Custom Style, it's a pain to fight him unless I revert to Normal Style, which then limits my battleship pool. Not help that he has these freaking thunderclouds always evading the fields and shooting omnidirectional lightning at everything. For the- what do you- Ah, I'm evading more than he is that I could paralyze and then struck down under the thumb of Zeus. Oh no, Gator doesn't work on him! Save me, Kratos! Yeah, bit of a flaw in the Gator strategy. It doesn't bypass obstacles or break guards. You'd be surprised how many viruses in the game end up doing that. Thus, we get Big Jim his guard and follow his lead to a black market dealer that can lead us to our stolen property, the passport online, and the chips having been sold to a woman named Miss Millions, a bored socialite that's eager for a net battle with her nabby Snake Man. Snake Man's an odd one, in that sword chips are worthless against him since we can't get close enough to strike. Coupled with his serpent attacks coming out of the pits between us, the mechanics for phasing him certainly seem unique in comparison to some others. The next day of the conference begins, introducing us to the ruler of the aforementioned Creamland, Princess Pride. Fun fact! In development, Princess Bride, instead of being an allusion to the movie The Princess Bride, was going to be named Princess Tron, as in Tron Bon from Mega Man Legends. As we got into with Goliath in the first Battle Network review, Legends references are all over the Battle Networks. Hell, Melu has a doll of one of Tron's minions stashed in her room. The meeting begins, with the Natopia official revealing their intel has informed them Gospel's intent is to create a super navy, the ultimate AI, and use it to conquer the world. And they shall name it Aura. What, this makes more sense than Mama's retcon into existence plan in the last dot egg entries. Frickin' environmental terrorists ruin everything. However, just as he's about to present the details, Everyone falls through trap doors. One by one, the other world net battlers are taken out, with Land's own trap leading him surrounded by a pit of fire, which he escapes using Dusex Makadano Jutsu! Yes, the wireless jack-in port Melu gave him allows him to access the network to get out of the trap, meeting up with Chod, where we find Raul having been heavily injured, and Chod now thinks we're the one behind all this? The fuck? You've gone past your previous rating on the douche scale, dude! Please, you're just still angry we kicked your ass three ways to Sunday and humiliated you during the First World 3 conflict. Well, I got one response to that! First, turn, Gator. I told you, it's totally broken. Raul wakes up after that and discloses to them how much of a dick Chaud's been, revealing the real perpetrator is a bit more blue-blooded. Inconceivable! She had that whole big sister complex thing going with Lan in the anime! To Melu's frustration. No, she did that with every girl around Lan in the anime. Hmm. Actually, this is what I was referring to earlier with the issues of making this location Netopia. 
Since Pride is from Creamland, Creamland is the English analog that would make more sense for this castle to be in, and the existence of these trapdoors in the castle not being known to the Netopia officials beforehand when they set their conference here, it would have made more sense on all fronts for this to be Creamland, and Pride setting this up on Gospel's behalf to make it so the world doesn't learn of their plans. Still, as I got into the series because of the anime, it's always odd to see her as a full-on villain here. Chud later musing on an old rumor which explains that, while Creamland was one of the first countries to get connected to the world network, it fell into obscurity once more major powers came online. The idea behind why Pride joined Gospel being so as to help her people reclaim their place in the world. And with the gang activity, thefts, and criminal actions on the streets in this location, again it would once more make damn sense for this to be Creamland and not Natopia. Granted, it doesn't quite so much work with how her lines are phrased, or her later showcased characterization. Though it would make more sense for that all to fit if she were based on Tron Bon. The castle maps I find interesting to play through, you needing to avoid phantom programs that'll chase after you, while you search each map for keys to intermediary doors these phantoms can't get past. Don't move fast enough or go down the wrong dead end at the wrong time? Bam! Have to go back to the spawning location. That, or they steal your stuff to mimic how you got your stuff stolen earlier. Though honestly, the viruses here are the bigger pain. You begin to encounter these dominard viruses, which are always guarding attacks until they're about to attack you, so the only way to kill them is to counterattack. Sword chips and the slasher battle chip are always particularly effective, but you can very easily blink and you miss the timing for that. Regardless, Pride's Navi is the one guarding the controls for the trap system, meaning we have to beat him down. Now, behold! Nightman! I have been waiting since I forgot to use it in the Riku reviews to make that joke. Nightman is Stone Man from the last game, if Stone Man was in any way actually a challenge, spending most of the battle rendered invulnerable, only dropping back to either attack in front of him, meaning just waiting for his guard to drop is a bad idea, crack the panels or cause a digital rock's fall, everybody die. But he can't raise his invulnerability very fast, so you just need to evade his attack while you still have panels to move on in order to damage him. Though in a fit of irony, the last trap activated by the security system before it jets down is under Pride herself. Ouch. I guess the Pride cometh before the fall? That was funny, damn it!